We've just gone live on YouTube and here on Zoom. You're very welcome. I'm Davy Phillip and my colleague is Oliver Moore from Art 2020. We need to, to, to um, pin that. Okay, so um, very welcome today. Uh, we're, we'll slow down a little because people are coming in. Um, we have over 140 people booked for this webinar, so it was very popular. So I just want to do some Zoom mechanics, uh, making sure that um, you're, uh, you keep the mute on, if you can, um, that we are going to use the Zoom, I mean the Zoom chat to introduce ourselves as a check-in, because we won't have time to hear everyone. It'd be nice to know where we're coming from. So I invite everyone to use the chat to say hello and where you're coming from. Um, we're going to use the chat as well if you want to come in. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the right camera now. Uh, so if you want to come in, uh, use the H in chat, which is like for hand, H in the chat, if you want to come in where there's a section between the presentations and after the presentations. Okay. Um, so any questions or reflections would be good to put in chat all the way through as well. And uh, so we're, we're going to get started uh, now uh, with a few presentations. Ollie, who are we going to listen to? Yeah, so we have uh, four presentations from four different parts of Europe. We have Clot Jordan Community Farm. So we're broadcasting from Clot Jordan right now. And the farm is a couple of hundred metres away. So that's the first presentation. We'll also then um, feature uh, a really exciting initiative from Brittany um, with uh, Javier Hamon and um, Louise Kelleher from ARC. So ARC is involved in a new project in France about regional socio-ecological transitioning. So uh, Javier and Louise will tell you about that. Uh, we will also have two more presentations uh, from Holland and from... Um, Belgium. So um, from Belgium, it's uh, Catal, and it's again a transition initiative involving food um, with uh, Antoine. And then uh, Desira, uh, a Horizon 2020 project, um, has Living Labs as part of Desira. Uh, Desira is about rural digitization, the um, socio-ecological context of rural digitization. So the Living Lab is um, Usterwald, and uh, a man called Jan will be presenting on that. So we have uh, Italian, French, uh, Dutch, Irish, and Belgian presentations today. And I'll pass over to Davy now. Well, so welcome to Local Food, Reimagining Regional Responses. Uh, today we are building on the first Forum Synergy webinar we did on local food to start to look at territorial approaches. How do we start to link up uh, many farms, food producers, co-ops, food initiatives in an area, in a region, in a territory and become an ecosystem or a food web that can shorten supply chains and our dependency and our vulnerability on long supply chains. We can ensure food security, we can ensure local livelihoods and we can ensure um, a resilient uh, uh, region or territory. So that's our, our objective today is to, to look at these. Uh, we have um, we're going to get started with a case study from where myself and Ollie are. So Ollie is going to uh, start. Hi everybody. Yes, yeah, so Clot Jordan is in the Midlands in Ireland. Uh, Clot Jordan Community Farm is a member owned and operated farm. Uh, we have six acres in the middle of a larger eco-village, which is 67 acres, and it's on the, uh, the edge of a town called Clot Jordan uh, in the Irish Midlands. So our farm is member-owned and operated. It's, a, it's got dozens of members from the eco-village and from the town of Clot Jordan. So it's about two-thirds eco-village, one-third town of Clot Jordan membership. It was the first and is still the biggest um, community-supported agriculture initiative in Ireland. You can see on the map here, there's an outline of the broader eco-village. And yeah, 
There's about 90 families at the moment uh, who are members. Uh, we have two farmers, we have volunteer coordinators, and then we have a number of volunteers. So you can see some of the membership here at a seed saving event. Um, and we describe what we're doing as practicing food sovereignty. So we haven't quite got it fully sorted out yet, but we're certainly practicing it, getting it together, working out how best to, to produce food on the small piece of land we have. So there's lots of elements that are interesting to the farm. One of them is just the number of people and young people and people from around Europe that we managed to bring to, to the Midlands in Ireland, even in the COVID context, actually, because we're food production and it's a primary activity. Uh, we've um, maintained a strong volunteer base so people can spend a year in Clot Jordan, working with the farm, learning from the farm, living in the community. Um, and it's been a really interesting dynamic, especially in a context of cities not being as interesting as they would have been outside of COVID times, to actually have a, a nice critical mass of people to engage with in a safe and socially distanced way, but nonetheless to be able to engage with people. So not only are there dozens of members of the farm in the community, there's a dozen or so people coming um, here every year to live and work and learn with us. So practicing food sovereignty involves being member owned and operated, but it also involves things like seed saving. So here you can see um, Mary involved in seed saving. We really focus as much as we can on open sourced, um, seed, open pollinated seeds from and in relationship with the Irish Seed Savers Organization in Clare. So we're very into the idea of um, seed sovereignty as well as food sovereignty or as part of food sovereignty. So our seeds are adapted to our climate, to our soil, to our, our agronomic reality, basically. Uh, we also, one third of the farm is in green manures at any one time um, because we are replenishing the soil. So we, you know, even though it's only six acres, uh, one third of that is constantly in, in green manures. We're also bringing in agroforestry elements and we always have a strong emphasis on agroecological techniques in general, such as crop rotation, companion planting, composted farmyard manure, and so on. Uh, member owned and operated also means that we set the budget ourselves. So we, we figure out how much we need to pay um, our farmers, how much we need to pay for seeds, how much we need to pay for inputs, how much we need to pay in general, and then we charge ourselves a certain amount of money. So we, we, you know, we set our own fees. We have a take what you need kind of distribution system, whereby the food is delivered twice a week to the coach house you can see in the picture here, um, and people come along and take what they think they should. So it's based on how busy you'll be for the week, if you have visitors or not, if you're away or not, um, what you grow yourself in your spare time or in your allotment and so on. Uh, and it rewards, this system is good because there's um, a fairness dimension in terms of um, food poverty. Also, um, the more you're committed and the more seasonally you're eating, the more you adjust your home environment, so to speak, to suit the farm and its produce, the better it is in terms of value. So, yeah, that's um, most of the core elements to the farm as a thing in itself from a practicing food sovereignty perspective. So Davy will now talk about um, how we're expanding in a digital context. So to expand our uh, market, we can supply 90 families uh, in the Clock Jordan area who could pick up uh, food from our distribution point, which is on the main street of the rural village. Uh, we've been thinking about how do we reach uh, more members or subscribers in a wider region and include other food producers and people that could add value to, to food. And so we have um, just today, it's been announced publicly, we've received some funding to set up our open food hub in our enterprise centre here in the Eco Village, this grey building. And this uh, open food hub will be uh, really providing sustainable routes to market for producers in a much wider, maybe a, a 50 to 100 mile radius. Uh, so we're working with a territory uh, of probably in rural Ireland that will probably be about 50, 60,000 people. So still even with 50 mile radius, it doesn't, it's not like the density of a city. So we're going to be providing this virtual uh, farmer's market through an open source digital platform called Open Food Network, which is already operating in different countries. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about Open Food Network, uh, but 
is being pioneered um, by uh, people involved in Via Campesina, food sovereignty, community supported agriculture, uh, food co-ops and open source uh, tech folks. So it, it's, a, it's a really refreshing, I think, look to a digital approach uh, to uh, market. Now, this will also, our Open Food Hub, provide digital training using our digital studio. So here's me and Ollie in the picture in the digital studio we're in right now doing this webinar. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of blended training and learning uh, the, through the studio. So we're going to be developing um, onboarding, mentoring and tuition for farmers and co-ops to use this digital platform and other open source digital tools uh, like FarmOS, a digital mapping, or Lumio for making decisions, or Open Collective for um, managing our funding between different domains. Uh, so, uh, as I said, OFN is established in 13 countries already. It enables this uh, ethical local supply chain. It helps uh, producers sell online uh, without having to set up their own online environment. Um, and buyer groups or food co-ops or CSAs can also use the platform um, to help them distribute their foods. So it really, I think, brings together a number of food producers, uh, food businesses in a region, in a territory, to create a, a food web, uh, an ecosystem of different entities that can create value in that place, uh, food security in that place, uh, and much more resilience to the shocks that we're going to face uh, as we go further into this uh, decade. So um, that's really just given us an example from what we're doing here. Um, so I'll just stop sharing my screen and Ollie will introduce our next speaker. Yeah, and just to finish off on that as well, I guess the Open Food Network as well is non-proprietary. So we, it's a, that's important to emphasize as well. It's coming from the... Um, the peer-to-peer -peer open source community, so the, it's not going to be sold on, um, you know, the code is owned by a charity and so on, for example. So um, our, that was our first presentation. Um, our second presentation will be via um, Louise Kelleher and Javier Hamon, uh, who will be talking about an exciting initiative in Brittany in the Redon uh, village area. Um, this is connected to ARC 2020, who um, are organizing this event along with uh, Cultivate and Form Synergies. And this is a new pro part of a new project that ARC is initiating on socio-ecological transitioning in France. So I'll pass over to Louise and Javier. Let me try to find your screen. Bonjour à tous. Uh, je partage mon Bonjour à tous, merci de nous accorder quelques minutes. Euh, je vais vous présenter un projet qui, a lieu en, qui se situe en Bretagne, à la pointe nord-ouest de, de la France. à travers euh, notamment des, euh, des projets de, de race locale et de, et, et de maraîchage. Uh, okay, so just to translate, um, so this is Xavier Amon, he's speaking from Redon in Brittany, um, and he wants to give us a little bit of geographical context here. Um, so uh, the part of Brittany where the, this initiative is located is that part of the agro industry in France, uh, they produce uh, a huge proportion of the food that's produced in, in France comes from this area. And in fact, this area concentrates all the um, negative aspects of um, agro-industrial agro um, agro sector, um, as well as um, uh, much of the resistance that's happening in France. So it's quite um, symbolic. Les, 
des, des acteurs de ce projet euh, sont tous issus d'un mouvement militant, euh, de plusieurs mouvements militants, pour certains depuis plus de 30 ans. Ça va de, du mouvement Slow Food à la Confédération Paysanne, en passant par euh, tout un tas d'organisations euh, qui, euh, qui militent depuis plus de 30 ans pour, pour euh, se battre contre cette agro-industrie et développer des projets beaucoup plus résilients. L'importance de ce projet, il parle du, du constat qui est fait par ces acteurs qui montre que la juxtaposition de toutes les petites initiatives les plus vertueuses ne constitue pas un pouvoir politique suffisant pour changer pour changer le modèle de monde. Et que finalement, toutes ces initiatives s'épuisent à prouver qu'on peut faire autrement. Mais le, la toute puissance capitaliste qui gouverne les décisions agroalimentaires nous, met, nous rend complètement inefficaces. Et en tout cas, une, cette, cette, nos expériences montrent que nous sommes incapables de porter politiquement un autre projet qui soit capable de changer les règles du jeu. Et ce projet, il est né de ce, de ce constat-là. OK, so um, all the uh, actors that came together to form this uh, project are from uh, an activist background mostly. Some of them have more than 30 years experience of um, battling with the uh, agro industry. So there's uh, people from the slow food movement, um, from um, Confederation Paysanne, which is part of um, Via Campesina in France. Um, And they've uh, basically, their project was started in response to um, an observation. They realized that for all the um, ethical um, well-meaning initiatives that are out there, it's not enough to secure change because of the, um, the challenges of the, the capitalist system. Um, it's not enough to secure real political change. And so they came together to uh, start this project to, um, to bring about that change. Merci. Ce, ces, ces, ces acteurs du territoire se sont réunis autour d'une fête qui a lieu toutes les quatre, tous les quatre ans, qui s'appelle la fête de la vache nantaise. Et cette fête a, a un grand mérite, c'est qu'elle, c'est une fête qui est, une, qui est portée par tout un territoire, et non pas par les institutions, mais par les habitants, par les citoyens, et par les, par les, associa les associations militantes pour une autre alimentation. Et l'intérêt majeur de cette, de cette grande fête, c'est qu'elle permet à tous les métiers liés à l'alimentation de se rencontrer. Ça va des agriculteurs, des éleveurs, des maraîchers, des cuisiniers, des bouchers, mais aussi des scientifiques, des journalistes qui s'intéressent à ces questions-là. Et la force de cette fête populaire, c'est qu'elle attire tout le monde, et, et, et surtout pas que le côté militant. Donc c'est une des rares fêtes paysannes en France euh, qui est capable d'attirer sur ce, pendant trois jours autant de monde, autant d'hiver, au bien au-delà de, de la thématique de l'alimentation. Et j'ai rarement vu euh, autant de, de monde aussi différents, même qui ne sont pas forcément d'accord autour d'une autour fête paysanne. OK, so the um, origins of this project were in the, uh, a festival that takes place every four years in France. It's called the, the Nantes um, Cattle Festival, Fête de la Vache Nantaise. Um, and in fact, it's, it's an opportunity for um, people from all sorts of backgrounds to come together, not just activists, but you have farmers, you have butchers, you have um, chefs, you have market gardeners, um, you have scientists, you have journalists. So you basically it's a, a chance for people to come together and exchange their points of view, even when they don't necessarily agree. Um, and it's really one of the rare kind of food and farming um, festivals like that in France, where you get such a, a mixture of people. Le second constat de cette fête, c'est que quand les acteurs du territoire avec les citoyens se mobilisent pour se prendre en main, alors euh, cette, cette dynamique est beaucoup plus forte que les initiatives des collectivités locales, comme les plans alimentaires territoriaux, qui dessinent un futur, euh, un futur désirable pour l'alimentation, mais qui ne donnent aucun moyen pour développer des initiatives sur le terrain. Et cette fête nous a permis de, de commencer à imaginer une fédération de tous ces acteurs là sur le territoire de, de l'agglomération pour construire nous-mêmes les outils qui nous manquent, pour construire cette, cette transition alimentaire. Les outils qui nous manquent, c'est des lieux pour se rencontrer entre professionnels, mais aussi ce sont des, 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 foncières, des foncières agricoles pour acheter des terres agricoles et, et pouvoir les, les mettre à disposition des porteurs de projets 
d'une agriculture durable. C'est aussi un besoin d'intégrer la population aux politiques alimentaires et non pas de leur, leur, leur faire descendre des méthodes toutes prêtes ou des concepts tout prêts, mais bien de les faire participer au quotidien pour qu'ils prennent eux-mêmes leur part, de, leur part aux, aux, aux projets locaux. C'est vraiment une question qui, qui, qui est transversale chez, dans, dans le projet de la, de, du consortium, c'est de laisser la, la part la plus importante possible aux citoyens et à la population, parce qu'on pense très sincèrement que sans a priori, chacun peut réfléchir à une alimentation durable. So um, the, the second uh, observation about this, this wonderful festival that happens um, is that uh, when you have people coming together, it's much more powerful as a force than, um, for example, the local food plans that have been uh, created by the French government in recent years, um, where um, it, a government created um, food plan um, that's basically imposed from on high. Uh, so people came together and realized it's much more effective if they are inspired to uh, build their own tools for a food transition. Um, and they realize what they need. They need spaces to meet and come together, but also they need access to land and they need to get people involved. Um, from across all sectors, not just having top down telling people what to do, but for people to realize that um, they can be involved in their food transition, that they can give a voice to communities to actually um, uh, have their own ideas about their food transition. Très concrètement, ce consortium de l'alimentation durable, il veut avoir pour rôle de, de fédérer toutes les initiatives des énergies et de faciliter les rencontres sur un territoire autour de l'alimentation. Ça veut dire fédérer tous les acteurs sur le foncier agricole, sur la difficulté à accéder au foncier agricole. Au moment où on voit arriver sur le territoire breton des groupes financiers pour racheter des terres agricoles et qui ne permettent plus aux projets locaux de, de se développer. Ce projet a pour but de faciliter aussi l'émergence d'outils de transformation alimentaire. C'est un, un, un territoire qui a de grosses productions, de grosses capacités de production, mais qui n'a plus aucun outil de transformation alimentaire. Donc les produits ressortent et reviennent transformés. Le but, c'est de relocaliser la transformation. L'objectif, c'est aussi d'être programmateur d'une saison, saison de culture alimentaire. Nous participons tous, d'où que l'on soit, à une production de culture alimentaire. Et cette production, à travers la migration des populations, les changements de le régime alimentaire doit se traduire par des manifestations culturelles. On a pour rôle aussi d'animer et de gérer un lieu de démocratique, de rencontre, de discussion, justement pour laisser la place aux citoyens pour s'exprimer sur toutes ces questions-là. Et enfin, des lieux de formation, des lieux de formation professionnelle et d'ateliers grand public. La formation professionnelle, elle a pour mission essentielle de faire se croiser tous les métiers dont je parlais au début de la présentation pour arrêter de réfléchir uniquement par corporatisme. Et puis enfin, pour nous, c'est un véritable outil démocratique, parce qu'il n'y a plus dans nos réseaux, dans nos lieux de vie, sur nos territoires, de lieux de discussion démocratique. Et je prends pour témoin le gros for les, les, gros, les grosses abstentions en France aux dernières élections, qu'elles soient européennes ou municipales, qui montrent bien la, la défiance de la population dans, dans les politiques qui sont menées. Louise, on n'a pas, on n'a pas le son, Louise. Non, okay, tu sorry. okay, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so the idea of this project is to bring together um, different energies from different movements. Uh, there's land access groups, um, because a big problem in this area is land grabs, where uh, there's no room for local projects to develop. And in fact, this part of Brittany uh, has a very high yield in terms of agriculture but there's no local processing facilities. So the food leaves the area and comes back processed, but none of it is processed locally. So the idea is to relocalize those processing um, plants. Um, and uh, apart from that, to um, help to, to get everybody involved to build a, a food culture. So they want to provide a, a democratic space for people to meet and discuss, a space for training, and really to make it a, a democratic tool Um, because there's no, no space for discussion at local level anymore, they've noticed. Um, 
and there's uh, in the recent elections in France, there was um, a very high number of people that didn't bother voting at all. So it's to re-engage people in that democratic process. Je, je terminerai juste par euh, une conclusion qui est, qui est tirée encore de l'expérience de tous les membres du consortium et qui, euh, qui font tous le même constat, c'est que le développement de nos idées passe souvent par des appels à projets, qu'ils soient européens, français ou, euh, ou régionaux. Or, cette culture et cette politique de l'appel à projets nous montre qu'elle est complètement inefficace tant on passe beaucoup de temps dans l'instruction des dossiers, dans la recherche de financement, au détriment du de l'énergie et du travail même dont on a besoin sur les territoires. Et que cette culture de l'appel à projet, elle, elle, elle est souvent euh, utilisée pour démarrer les projets, mais, mais il n'y a aucun suivi. Et une fois le projet terminé, euh, bah, s'il n'a pas la chance de perdurer tout seul, euh, il, est, il est oublié. Alors, en tout cas, c'est une grosse, grosse difficulté de, remarquée par tous les acteurs de, du consortium, de toutes les, les parties prenantes. On a la volonté de nous émanciper de ce type de financement qui est contre-productif et qui nous empêche d'être vraiment très concret, d'autant plus qu'en face, nous avons des, des grosses organisations financières qui arrivent aujourd'hui avec des capitalisations de, de plusieurs millions euh, contre lesquelles on n'a on a aucun pouvoir. Donc, Pour ne pas être, euh, être confronté à, au bénévolat permanent et au militantisme pour une cause qui, dans laquelle on s'oublie tous individuellement, alors, on appelle très sérieusement euh, tous ceux qui veulent encourager les projets de territoire à penser de nouveaux modes de financement euh, pour ne pas être aliénés à une administration qui, euh, qui est complètement inefficace. Voilà, je vous remercie beaucoup de votre écoute et je reste disponible pour toutes les questions. OK, so um, the final um, observation that they've made with the project is that there's um, too much time spent on applying for funding, on paperwork, Um, what's uh, the, the process of um, calls to tender in France. And a lot of time and energy is basically wasted in what's a counterproductive process. They want to keep that energy for um, actually making difference, making a change on the ground. They want to escape that. And then there's the additional challenge of um, the capitalism. So really to focus the energy um, on the ground, local initiatives. Um, and that's, that's all from Xavier. He said, thank you very much. Um, we will, of course, be um, sending around the, uh, the slides. We have um, um, many more slides that were um, translated so we can make those available if people are interested um, afterwards in French and in English. Um. Okay, thanks, uh, Xavier. Thanks, Louise. Uh, that was um, really insightful. So we've heard from Ireland and we've heard from France. And we're going to take a, just a quick break before we go into hearing the stories from Liège in Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, so maybe we'll, uh, there's a couple of reflections in the chat. Um, Matteo, would you come in and just ask that or, or reflect on that? It's good to hear other voices. Matteo? Okay. You're not unmuting. Matteo just uh, mentions the lack of food processing equipment. It's a really good point. We're seeing the same here. Uh, we're exporting um, food to be added value to somewhere else and then bring back. So that's interesting. Um, I had some problem. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh yeah, there you are, Matteo. Okay, so, sorry. No, no, thanks you. Thank you, Debbie. You actually captured my my reflection. It was just a common trend I I observed uh, this lack of ownership um, over the means of transformation, and um, likely there are cases like the one we have seen from France, which gives hope. And it was just a reflection. Thank you. Thanks, Matteo. The other uh, thing we have to democratize is distribution. Okay. You mean we, we are dependent on um, supermarkets, we're dependent on middlemen taking cuts, and the more, if we're practicing food sovereignty, we could take 
uh, we could take more control over distribution. Anyone else get any thoughts or reflections? Antoine there has a comment. Um, Antoine, do you want to maybe mention your comment? <clears throat> yeah, j j just to say that um, uh, we've, we've seen uh, several uh, cooperatives and uh, mutualized um, food transformation projects try to take off and, and actually uh, really struggle to, um, to remain sustainable over time and, and um, I guess uh, compete with much, much uh, larger scale, industrialized scale uh, transformation, uh, uh, food transformation organizations. And so I think what, what we've seen is that it, it appears as if the, uh, the margins have been squeezed so thin in that sector that it's difficult to, um, um, to, to create um, or, or to, to establish uh, value creation from food produce into uh, transform food pro products uh, on, a, on a, what I would call local or human scale uh, uh, basis. Thanks, Anton. Yeah, and um, I guess as well, what was obvious as well was that um, in, in the case from Brittany, it's like quite a big area geographically, uh, which is doing a lot of uh, this sort of coordinated work. Whereas in Claude Jordan, the example was very much from a, a single um, small place trying to reach out and bridge out. But like this building we're in, you know, is an enterprise center that has some food processing capacity. Um, it's a good hub to kind of work from. I guess it's that kind of um, distribution and processing hubs are really useful um, to scale up beyond the kind of local. So it's it's getting that kind of infrastructural, you know, asset without actually spending all your life uh, filling in funding applications is. Um, so like, what are the options there? Maybe like um, the old creameries, for example, in Ireland could be reanimated. Um, maybe in Brittany as well, because of the, the tradition of milk production, there could be some old um, cooperative elements that could be engaged as well. I'd be interested to hear about the, the dynamic tension, I suppose, between the um, old and new food systems or conventional and um, alternative kind of food systems in Brittany and whether there's any synergy there potentially for, um, you know, assets from traditional, um, assets from mainstream food, um, agri-food systems to be usable by the more alternative um, food systems. I know, for example, there's a machinery co-op movement in France that's quite strong for sharing machinery. Like, are there any synergies that can be created? I think Carlos has an interesting question. Carlos, if you want to come in, Carlos Elia, um, on democratizing distribution through innovation. Uh, you're making a point there. Would you like to speak yeah. it? Well, I'm just actually joining what Matteo um, was saying about the um, uh, lack of food processing equipment. And also, well, I've seen the, the, all the, the comments across on the chat, also uh, distribution. I mean, I'm quite agree. And I think innovation um, in actually distribution is a quite interesting niche to work on innovation, um, you know, Supply chain in agriculture and food production is actually is mainly um, monopolized by uh, agro industries, really. So, um, you know, there might be an interesting to analyze or to assess how we can actually support the link urban and uh, rural areas through innovation and, you know, shorten the supply chain. I mean, creating um, different and closer market niches. So we will work both sides, like democratizing access for uh, market and also sustainable uh, distribution for food um, through innovation. I don't know, apps. Uh, in China, there are very interesting um, experiences on using technologies for, um, yeah. for, I mean, for um, the small holders down there. It might be interesting experiences that we can be also to reply in the EU, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, our challenge may be um, digitizing with farmers not having the competencies to put their market online. So uh, that's why I really like the Open Food Network as a, a technical, logical innovation, if you like. Um, and, and it democratizes that distribution. It puts it into the hands of the people. It's user-owned. We own the platform because there's been problems before with um, proprietary platforms uh, that maybe aren't working for the, the investors and they pool them. 
that happened in the UK and they had to quickly be onboarded to Open Food Network. There's problems with interoperability that we need to be able to speak between platforms. Uh, um, and I think there's a lot more thinking to do there. Okay, well, that was a nice pause for some reflections. We're going to now go back into a couple of other case studies. Ollie? Yeah, hi. So we're going to go into two case studies now. Um, the first one you've heard briefly from Antoine, actually already just in the comment there, but Antoine Lejeune is from Catal in uh, Liège. So Antoine will tell you about his initiative and after Antoine speaks, uh, Jean Jan, Jansma, Jansma and uh, Sylvia Rolandi from Desira will be speaking. So Jan from Usterworld and Sylvia from Desira, the project, Sylvia Rolandi. And apologies for not mentioning your name earlier, Sylvia, sorry. Uh, so uh, we'll pass over to Antoine now. Okay, thank you. Um, and and Catal has not got nothing to do with uh, uh, farm animals. It's actually a, a pun in French um, uh, to try and sort of uh, describe uh, the, the need the need to uh, recreate a linkage uh, between uh, the soil or the earth and 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 how food is uh, being produced and and consumed within uh, the Liège area. And uh, can I change my screen? Yes, I can. So just to briefly introduce um, uh, La Ceinture Alimentaire Liégeoise, it's basically aiming to develop an ecosystem. Um, it's been uh, trying to uh, bring together lots of uh, energies. And I here sort of uh, refer to the point which Xavier made of, uh, of seeing uh, lots of local projects sometimes then uh, gradually lose steam. And the idea here is to try and sort of keep that energy by Cross fertilizing as much as possible uh, through various cooperative projects uh, around around achieving a transition of um, uh, food food and, and where food is being uh, consumed from uh, in the for the Liège population, but keeping also a, a social agenda at, at the core of, of those initiatives. Uh, it's a relatively small um, um, uh, association in French. Um, uh, the name will come back in a minute, um, which has been receiving uh, um, regional funding. Uh, but has been also uh, energizing a lot of different uh, cooperatives uh, and, and a lot of projects have sort of gradually emerged and um, Ceinture Alimentaire has been acting as, a, as both an incubator for new project as, projects as well as uh, um, a support point for other cooperatives uh, trying to bring people together. And the one I want to um, uh, place emphasis on today, um, and so I'm strictly speaking not from Ceinture Alimentaire, I am... Uh, uh, a member of uh, Les Petits Producteurs, uh, which would stand for the Small uh, Producer Cooperative, uh, which was founded uh, in 2017. Uh, the founder is this, um, uh, particularly this fellow here at the center, uh, who had, um, I think, personally a painful experience from uh, working for uh, the large uh, food distribution networks uh, and, and sort of suffered from that uh, experience, uh, professional experience. And the idea here was to essentially try to um, um, create um, a sort of um, by, by sort of vacuum creating demand uh, to help foster the emergence of a much stronger local um, organic uh, and or sustainable sustainable agriculture uh, food production in the locality. So recreate uh, a local production uh, for food for the for the the local population. And I guess the, the, the initiative is based in Liège, but fundamentally the concept is to try and demonstrate that this works, is sustainable and can be deployed. The other point I would like to emphasize is that this was also more or less in the, in the broad time of uh, this uh, film, which had a lot of resonance in the French speaking community uh, by Cyril Dion uh, called Demain, and then the, the follow up uh, to that. And the idea here is to, um, you know, um, humbly, I would say, step by step, try to change the world by uh, taking our, sort of our sort of um, uh, initiative in our hands and try and effect change and, and show uh, an impact. And, and uh, I mean, this you could treat this as being small or you could treat this as being uh, highly um, uh, exciting as a development. Uh, after 300 a bit years, uh, we have four shops uh, now in the Liège area. Um, we have an annual turnover of three and a half million euros. We've created 21 jobs, which are permanent jobs. Um, uh, and, and we've been uh, demonstrating strong support to local producers, 
um, and, and have helped them uh, stabilize uh, their, their, their activity and, and, uh, and, and also um, uh, have, a, I guess, better persistence in their, in their production. So just in a nutshell, you know, this is perhaps not unique, uh, but appears to be a very uh, uh, powerful um, uh, concept in, in, in the local um, area in Liège. We're try trying to keep things simple, one product for one need, uh, things which are, uh, which are sort of uh, uh, marginal or, or arguably we can do without, we will do without in the shop. All of the, all of the project products are organic and all locally sustainable with one exception, which is that uh, we will source pro products directly from other European countries uh, where there are main staple products such as uh, oranges, for example, which don't grow uh, in, in, in Belgium. The idea is that by keeping th things as simple and, and straightforward as possible, by removing intermediaries in the uh, value chain, we are protecting uh, as much as possible um, a value for uh, whomever is at the core of it, which is the producer. And so the way the overall economic uh, balance of the project is, is uh, structured is that we're trying to, uh, uh, to price um, for, the, for, the, for the consumer, to price great products at the right level and ensure that as much as possible from the margin, uh, from, from the actual sort of um, the value of that uh, uh, retail sale, uh, sale goes back to the producer. And so I'm highlighting at the bottom here with this carrot uh, example uh, that, that we're really trying to squeeze um, the non-essential um, cost elements as, as much as possible, um, still pay uh, the workers um, uh, as decently as, as, as possible. Uh, but also focus much of the uh, the value back to the producers. The other thing which I would like to emphasize uh, uh, to, to finish on, on uh, Les Petits Producteurs is, is the notion that uh, we're insisting a lot upon the way in which the governance has been constructed uh, by um, ensuring that both uh, the, the workers in the, in, in the shops, but also clearly the producers, have a strong voice in the way in which we are, uh, uh, we are uh, working with them. And so they're, they're clearly also uh, strongly represented in, 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 into the governance of the organization. And um, we have been building those shops stepwise with each time um, a foundation of local producers who are uh, essentially committing with us uh, to, to ensure that, that we are creating a, an output to the market for their products. Um, on, on higher prices than what they can they could get previously from uh, um, uh, middlemen and distributors um, and 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 thus trying to create a self um, a balanced sort of a, bit, a mutually balanced uh, uh, path forward to ensure that we can build up um, uh, offer for more consumers which hopefully then creates more demand and helps stabilize uh, and improve the uh, the, uh, the economical environment also for the producers. That project also allowed us to identify uh, the fact that um, uh, a lot of th there is a lot of enthusiasm um, uh, we find uh, in especially with, perhaps with the younger uh, generation in in uh, in the, the perhaps romantic concept of going back to their roots and and uh, putting their, their hands in the soil. Uh, and then finding that it's actually quite a bitter experience uh, because working, working uh, and producing vegetables or um, food is actually quite a, it's a very hard uh, life uh, and is not very remunerative. And, and we, we've been trying to, to think of ways of supporting um, um, uh, people who wanted to, to um, um, embrace that, uh, that, that um, way of life and that passion. Uh, I don't want to say career. Um, and, and finding ways of, of give, giving them a leg up such that they can establish themselves and still um, uh, help uh, change the way in which uh, uh, food is produced locally. And so from uh, Lepti Producteur and, and in, in close collaboration or in close dialogue with the, uh, the local authorities um, who need to, need to be continuously pushed and, um, and uh, elbowed and uh, uh, shocked sometimes in in uh, in trying to to to, to generate ideas and and um, help uh, effect change. Uh, we we um, effectively um, with strong support and engagement from uh, Centure Alimentaire found ways of proposing uh, innovative uh, projects to make use of uh, available 
potentially um, a usable arable soil uh, in, in the urban areas. And so we've managed to secure long-term lease uh, with a rent-free uh, model from the city of Liège uh, and, and um, have offered uh, to, and you can see them on the picture um, uh, here, Felicia and David, uh, to, to, to offer to, to um, establish the, the, the framework for, for two young um, vegetable crop uh, producers to establish themselves onto this uh, new plot of land um, uh, and, and essentially uh, build up a business um, where Lipti Producteur is a, is, a, uh, is a partner, is a supporter, but not by any means um, uh, an, an, an entity which might uh, control or limit um, their aspirations going forward. Uh, so what we've tried to do is to organize uh, a very innovative, because I think it's quite unique, concept whereby we are helping them. Um, so one of the problems is fixed, they have access to land through the, uh, the support from the city. Uh, the other problem typically uh, such producers have is that they're struggling to raise the financing to uh, establish themselves. And here we're just making that capital available for free to them with a, with a gradual repayment scheme over, over several years. We're guaranteeing to them that we will take care of commercialization, which often is um, a challenge. Someone who is a great um, agriculture might not be a, a great um, salesperson. Um, we're also working with them to help them plan their production and, and um, not try to do everything, but focus their efforts um, in, in a meaningful way alongside other um, vegetable crop producers um, working uh, in, in the region. And we're also allowing them to go to, to work, to, to live through winter by giving them part-time jobs um, uh, to, to give them a secured uh, uh, revenue uh, through the year. And, and the, the short conclusion is season one was a success. Uh, they're now uh, increasing substantially the, the plot of uh, for production for next year and hiring a, three, a third team member. So it looks like something which uh, hopefully we can then establish as a, a proven concept and and uh, and then respond to lots of inquiries we've had from other neighboring uh, cities uh, wanting to offer us into this scheme or to other organizations a similar concepts of uh, providing land for free uh, to be cultivated and if i still have some time um, i didn't check my watch one thing which i think um, i want to emphasize is that one measure of success for this project, uh, besides um, hopefully educating the Liège population on, on uh, healthier eating uh, and supporting local producers in, in having a, 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 a less difficult life financially and, and uh, perhaps a, a more planned uh, um, work environment, is to get to a stage where we can demonstrate that this project um, is self-funding, is financially robust, can survive um, uh, the potential disappearance of one or the other of the founders. We want to make sure that we can prove that this concept is so robust that if one of those uh, unique individuals who have been the uh, uh, conceivers of the, the, the ideas uh, decide to do something else, the project is still there. And then the idea would be to offer this as an open source uh, project because there, we feel there are lots of uh, ways in which we've established uh, strong collaborations with the local producers, uh, getting them to talk to each other, uh, agree amongst them uh, who will produce what at what point of the season to avoid the, the typical trend is for people to try and produce everything because otherwise they feel they cannot offer the produce uh, the products to the to the shops um, and people want to have tomatoes as well as salad at the same time. Well, we can have them focus their their, their work. And lots of other things which are probably there isn't enough time to, to cover now. The other thing which, of kids seem seemingly enthusiastic. The other thing I want to emphasize is that um, um, the central part of this was to create long term sustainable jobs. Uh, and and uh, we really want to ensure that uh, the, the colleagues working for the, for the uh, organization have uh, a very significant time to. Um, get to know the products better, although they are not themselves uh, farm growers, and, and spend time with the producers to um, build a real bond uh, uh, between uh, uh, the producers and, and, and the shop uh, staff, uh, and also give them a, a strong voice by being a, a statutory board um, uh, members uh, to, 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 to lean on the governance as well, which is important. There were questions posed to us, the speakers uh, also, and, and on, on the notion of how can we strengthen regional food networks. 
I think an, ele an essential element here, which I want to flag is that um, whatever, whichever those project has to continuously work on, on, on its internal coherence and, and be sure as to what is exactly what you're trying to achieve and not try to do too many different things. Stay focused and accept that some people might be working alongside you, other cooperatives, other uh, projects and initiatives, um, and, and rather focus on ways to uh, strengthen each other and not worry too much that uh, people might be doing something which is quite close to what you're doing. And so being transparent about our objectives Sharing information continuously will, if everyone has the same uh, drive, help uh, align uh, interests and not focus so much on this notion of competition and, and fear. We're here to try and build things, not to fear what might happen. Otherwise, we're, we're just going to get nowhere. And then fin finally, um, just a word on digitalization, which was an another topic raised. Uh, of course, for something like Les Petits Producteurs, um, the digital world is essential for visibility, for also making our project known and, and uh, um, uh, reaching out to potential new customers. Um, but I think one of the things which has also um, come out very, very strongly from the recent uh, uh, periods of lockdown and so on is, is that the, there is a very deep rooted aspiration from people to not lose sight and touch of each other. And, 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 and here I would rather emphasize the, the, the local aspect and, and, um, and also using those projects as um, uh, uh, places where people meet and exchange ideas and cross fertilize um, wishes and aspirations as something very important. And yes, of course, we need digitalization, but let's not uh, lose uh, the, the hugs and the kisses because uh, COVID is not helping that just now. Thank you. Thanks, Anton. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, really good to hear that. I'm going to actually uh, share a story in the chat on your project, which has just been done by Communities for Future, uh, which is an action program across Europe for sustainability and climate action from the community up. Uh, we're going to have one more presentation, uh, this time um, from Oosterworld in, in Netherlands. Uh, remember to put in to the chat any reflections or questions because after this we're going to try to weave together, see if there's any patterns there and, and look to see how we might progress this sort of ecosystem approach to local food in our, in our territories. Okay, so um, delighted now to have with us, um, we're going to have um, uh, Jan... Jansma from Oosterwald Living Lab, which is part of the project uh, Desira, which is uh, exploring a Horizon 2020 project that is exploring the economic and social impacts of digitization in rural areas. And we'll be hearing as well from Sylvia, who's part of that project. So I'll hand over to Jan and Sylvia. And then remember, after this, we're going to really bring the um, different insights or patterns that we can um, um, identify to see how we accelerate this approach to local food. So Jan and Sylvia. Jan, it's, it's me, I will, I will start. It's a small leap from Liège or uh, as we pronounce it, Luik to the Netherlands. I will introduce you the city of Almira. Um, the city of Almira uh, spawned uh, a new type of urban planning, um, a new approach that integrates uh, urban agriculture and urban planning. And the rationale behind it is that, of course, uh, cities have to expand, um, but this city wanted to, in, in the parallel, wanted to save farmland while expanding. Um, here on the map, you see where Almir is. Almir is in the outskirts of the Amsterdam metropolitan region. Um, it's a new town. It's situated in a polder. The polder is a reclaimed land, reclaimed from the sea. Uh, that's an hobby in the Netherlands. Uh, and this is a new town. Um, about It accommodates about 210,000 uh, residents. And as I said before, it has to expand. Um, 
and you see on the, the right side the, the area of Oosterwald. It's a, this area is about 4,300 hectares. For the people on the islands, it's, it's about 12,000 acres. Uh, and this area has in, have to, in future to accommodate about 50,000 residents. But key in this area is that it is about residing people, but also about urban agriculture. Um, each resident in this area has uh, will purchase land to to build his 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 home has to leave 50 percent of the plot he purchased to food production so the urban dweller in this area is also the urban farmer please next slide uh, sylvia thank you um, the area started uh, to of the first settlers started in 2016, so we are now um, about four years uh, in uh, in a run. Um, today, about 1,800 people living over in Oosterwold, and this is part of the area. Um, and what does this new way of planning delivers? Um, for example. Right on the top is a farmer's family who purchased 40 hectares in this area. And to subsidize the, their purchase, they developed apartments on the farm. So about 20 families living on that farm, uh, be, being, uh, being part of the farmer community. But on the other hand, we also see uh, right to the right, uh, private families who purchase land and, and produce food on part of their plot. We see CSAs, uh, we see on top left uh, an urban winery with uh, lodges and maybe remarkable to the left, this person, this guy doesn't have land in Oosterwald, but he grows food on other people's land because you can understand that not all the newcomers in Oosterwald have green thumbs uh, and want to produce food. So he steps in uh, that gap. Um, next slide, please. Yes, please. So, yes, thank you. Some facts about Oslo. Um, 1,800 residents. Um, most of the people are just working outside uh, Oslo. So it's not, there are not full time farmers, it, not even semi full time farmers. Um, but still, they embrace urban agriculture and they see it as a part of uh, a genuine development of an area, their area, social green and biodiverse. Most People have a plot, produce food about 500 to uh, 2,500 square meters. Um, most fruit and vegetables, and most of the production is being shared with family, friends. But you can imagine that uh, if you have uh, more than 1,000 square meters uh, food and vegetable production, you have an overproduction. And that's why the reason that uh, we stepped in, we is, is Wagen University, and we introduced uh, this uh, area in the Daisira project because we see that, um, we, and, and we, we carried out um, a an, um, survey amongst the people in Oosterwald. And this shows that uh, the people are aware that, uh, next slide, please, yes, people are aware that. Um, now, previous, please, uh, are aware that there is will be an, uh, uh, they will produce more than they can consume. Um, oh, that's a bit too fast. <laughs> yes, yes, please, thanks. Um, and because most of them are laymen in food production, but, uh, or layperson, sorry, uh, um, but they are embracing, as I said before, uh, urban agriculture. And so they are now trying to find new pathways to, to develop their knowledge and, uh, and experience in uh, food production and processing. Uh, and they show there is a need, not only on physical location, but also physical systems to share, uh, maybe a coordinator or a, a knowledge platform. And as I said, uh, we stepped in and um, in cooperation with a cooperative, uh, shortly established by by residents of this area we we try to to dovetail new uh, digital systems with the needs of the people so that 
um, there is an uh, there could be an, an knowledge transfer, but also food transfer, not not only in the area but also with the region and with the city of Almira, um, commercially but also non-commercially, uh, and, and that's a, a kind of complex because it's it's not you're not working with farmers, um, not with professionals. This, this are, it's, it's a myriad of different types of people with, with different rationales and, and intentions concerning food production. And I think that's, um, that's an interesting and new development. I think we will see more throughout Europe when cities are expanding and still want to produce food locally. Um, so, Let's step to the project of Dicera, which, which which we are part from uh, in within um, the project of uh, Osterwald, the Living Lab of Osterwald. So I leave the floor or uh, the screen now to uh, Sylvia. And I'm sorry for uh, before it was changing by itself. I don't know what happened. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So. Um, the presentation that we just had in Gen Ed, it is one of the living labs that Desira has. Uh, and Desira, it is, as you, see for, as you see from the acronymus, means digitalization, and we study economic and social impacts in rural areas. It is a, an Horizon 2020 project, and it involves several partners, not only university, but also NGOs and SM, SMEs. And so we have an interdisciplinary consortium. Um, the aim of the project, it is to improve, which is the capaci capacity of the society and political bodies to figure out which are gonna be the challenges and which are the challenges of, of digitalization. And most of all, in three main areas, in agriculture, forestry, and rural areas and we do so within utilizing and uh, building a network of 20 living labs uh, that we're gonna study and through the living, living lab we are assessing which are the present and future impacts of digitalization in these three specific areas. And then furthermore, there is another instrument that we're using and we are going to use even more in the future, which is a rural digitization forum, which is gonna help to discuss and share information. So not only um, the positive outcomes of digitalization, but also which might be the problems and issues that um, the Living Labs members as all of those people that are gonna interested in this topic and are facing issues or uh, finding good outcomes from the digitalization can share information and discuss about this topic. First of all, why we do so? Because we um, started studying the digitalization in relation with these three areas according to the fact that digital technologies applied in specific scenarios, and in our case, these scenarios are the living labs, um, they produce social economic impacts. So the reason why these impacts are so important, it is the fact that we're not living anymore in a context in which we have only the um, a tool and the effects of the tool. We live in a complex in a context that is much more complex right now. And here there is a. I, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but just to show you the fact that right now we have what is called a social cyber physical system. It means we have. Um, products, real ones. So for example, in this case, we have the crops and we have the people and we have the tools that we use and we have the drones and those things are still physical. But then we have the cyber part, which are the data that are gonna connect the um, information that are being gathered together from the uh, sensors, for example, and then have been elaborated again and then they're going to um, be um, read, for example, 
with the mobile from the farmers that is going to make uh, decisions and after those decisions we're going to have impacts which are going to affect the social part so they're going to affect farmers businesses policymaker and entire villages so that is the point that is really interesting for us and for this discussion today is the fact that villages and rural areas can have several impacts from the use of digitization and digitalization. So be aware and raise our awareness of which, which, which might be the issues and, or the good possibilities that could be utilized. It is the fact that is the core study of the ZIRA. And this is the reason why what I think it will be, could be interesting for you today it is to check at the living labs. So at all the living labs work that, is, uh, that you can find in the Zira webpage. So as you can see here, we have a map and within the map, there is the description of, of all living labs. And then you can also join the rural digitization forum. So it will enhance everyone to discuss furthermore about these topics and maybe find solutions for some of the issues that we were raising today too. So I don't wanna, um, I, I, want, I was really short because I don't wanna be too long in this, in, on this uh, part. And I think it's really good to have more time for the discussion and I wanna thank the organizers again. And here you have all the links uh, to our pages if you want to, know something more or participate to the forum thank you very much so thank you sylvia and thank you jan that was very interesting and anton as well from liege so now we have got a number of stories we've heard and we are going to try and hear other insights bring in more voices i just want to pause though and reflect a little on uh, the Francophone English divide. We need to build bridges because hearing two stories that we don't often hear in the English speaking world uh, is so rich and inspiring. So we want to have uh, with Forum Synergies and Art 2020 and Cultivate, we want to continue this and maybe include translation and be able to have more people participating. Just want to thank everyone who's uh, joined us from the, in the live stream on YouTube. You're very welcome. This is a forum synergy webinar on local food systems, but now reimagining uh, from a, a regional or territorial approach, more an ecosystem or food web and building resilience in our local areas. Uh, we've had four presentations and now we're gonna try and weave together or share insights or hear some other voices. If you're on the Zoom call and you'd like to come in, put an H on uh, the chat. Uh, you'll see that a lot of the answers, a lot of the questions have been answered. Anton is very prolific in the chat, <laughs> answering all the questions. That's fantastic. So if anyone wants to come in, just an H. And I, I, I suppose what we're really interested in is identifying patterns from the four stories we've heard or seeing any similarities with what you're doing or bringing in some new information. Please, may I speak? Please do, Michael. Greetings, Michael Dower. I'm a member of Forum Synergies and a supporter of ARC 2020. I wanted to make three connected points. First, I was very surprised that the speaker in Brittany did not mention the two of the great French systems, which are the AMAPS, that is the Association pour le maintien d'une agriculture paysanne, on the one hand, and the CVAM, Centre d'initiative pour valoriser l'agriculture et le milieu rural, which when we did studies in Brittany 10 years ago, were growing in power and influence, 
and were very much concerned about the building of local food systems, of cooperatives, and other things which would cut through or were designed to cut through the domination by the agro-food industry, which the speaker described. My second point is that that was part of uh, an EU-funded project called FARN, Facilitation Alternative, Facilitating Alternative Agro-Food Networks, which um, studied local food systems in Austria, England, France, Hungary, and Poland, and examined, brought all the results together, examining the what, what the experience of these food systems implied for policy and action, um, including things like the adverse impact of hygiene rules upon small producers and other, other uh, things like um, the tendering procedures, which were mentioned by the, by the speaker. Uh, so, uh, and that is available. The, the results of that work in 2010 are available. I have a feeling of sort of going round in circles, having been working in, in rural European affairs for the last 30 years, although I'm now in England, so I'm a, you might think that I was moving out of it, unless Boris Johnson changes his mind. Nevertheless, what strikes me is that we keep going round in circles, uh, doing studies funded by the European Union, producing interesting results, and then forgetting them. Um, and I, I, there is, in fact, an absolutely enormous number of local food initiatives of very many kinds in Europe. And somehow we seem to start, we, 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 we can't start a conversation as if these were new ideas. Um, I wonder whether either ARC 2020 or perhaps more, more fruitfully Echo Leeds might, might like to have a real center of expertise, supported perhaps by Wageningen, support a center of expertise which brings together the experience of all this great army of local food initiatives throughout the European Union and beyond. Okay, thanks Michael for those observations, comments and pointing us in a certain direction. Uh, I think the, the, there is a need for that, um, although I'm excited about new things that I don't, I've maybe not been in this field as long as yourself, but I'm do, I do see in the last few years a real excitement in our CSA movements and our open food network movements in food sovereignty, uh, the just transition with a focus on food. And of course, we lose a lot of that knowledge, but we are, I think, um, there's an opportunity here. So let's see who else would like to come in. Does anyone else want to come in? There is quite a rich conversation now in the chat. Um, I don't know where to start. So is anyone, would anyone like to come in to speak their question? Or I will pick one out. I think there's an interesting point from Pablo, which is responding to a few people. Uh, at what point does digitization uh, fight rural depopulation and capital extraction from agro ecosystems? Uh, I think that's a, a good question maybe to explore because the open food network that I introduced, um, I, I think is, is like keeping wealth in a, a region. It's not extracting the wealth out as we would see in maybe proprietary digital uh, approaches. So um, would anyone like to pick that up? Pablo's point there in the chat. Um, Liz is, is also skeptical of a heavy reliance on, on technology on the farm. I know teaching permaculture, this is always a, 
sensitive topic. Uh, people that want to get back to the land and forget about technology and others that see the opportunity of sensing and aggregating value and keeping wealth in our local communities. Uh, so maybe, uh, I don't know, Sylvia um, from, from Desira? Yeah, is, uh, sure. Um, I mean, I think that there might be huge opportunities that we can catch. I say might because there are some issues that are still have to be studied or uh, at least tested. So this is the reason why, for example, we uh, are working with living labs. So we're not assuming that we're going to have certain impacts or effects, but we have to be aware that certain tools exist. So maybe it is worthy also for um, uh, farmers and also from farmers coming from small villages uh, to be aware that they exist, that they, they can, they could um, utilize, which might be the positive outcomes. And, and also, and I think we should not be scared of what we don't know, but we should uh, learn a little bit more about things and try to understand them. And then maybe decide that we don't want to try those things. So, this is the same thing with digitization and digitalization and the um, tools that can be utilized. So nice. for example, um, it, is, it might be also a bridge among the rural areas and the cities. Yeah. So it, it means that we don't have to leave the rural areas, we can still live in the rural areas, but maybe farmers might have more opportunities and might have higher incomes for the work they, they are doing and they will do. Thanks, Sylvia. So yeah. there's threats and opportunities with digitization. Uh, Liz in the chat is asked to come in. So if you want to unmic yourself, Liz, yeah. and come in. If anyone else wants to come into this chat, if you're on the Zoom call, H for hand in the chat. Liz. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks, Sylvia, as well. Now, I don't want to say, of course, you. can you hear me? Sorry, OK. I don't want to say like, oh, technology is terrible and we should always ignore it. I just feel, so I work with an NGO and we also are dealing a lot with climate justice um, and in general, like social justice. And I just, I think your approach of saying it's good to check it and see what's available and what helps. But I think it is good to have a bit of skepticism as well, because for instance, like all this data monitoring or the use of drones and things like this, it's using resources that aren't necessarily needed. And also like an assumption that, that the best thing for the world is to kind of continue on the course that we're on, which is like this continuation of rural places producing food and giving them technology so less people need to be there. Um, city centers sort of staying the same where I guess the kind of like thinkers that I'm dealing with and like the farmers that I'm talking to and people who would like to be on the land maybe see some other ideas that yeah. involve taking a step away from technology but yeah I, I wouldn't say we should say like a no to all technology I think of course it's nice to to see what's out there and how it can be used so. okay brilliant Liz I mean yeah there's obviously uh, concerns and data concerns uh, energy concerns around using technology, but I do see the potential of a rural renaissance uh, moving away from the city and being able, as we do in rural Ireland, working at a European level with ARC 2020 or Ecolease. So there's an, there is, it's just balance, isn't it? My colleague Ollie and then Hannes Lorenzen um, wants to come in. Yeah, just on that as well, to be specific, I think it's about appropriate technology rather than any old technology. So, you know, FarmHack and L'Altirier Paysan in France, for example, are good examples of the, you know, the subtle use of technology um, with a technological sovereignty approach, actually. I mean, that's kind of part of L'Altirier Paysan's modus operandi is that the, you can make the things easily from resources that are available and are made by farmers for farmers. So I think some of these appropriate technology approaches are important rather than just blind belief in technology as an a priori good. Yep. So I think it's important to keep an eye on that though for sure um, and to look into 
how technology can best be best be used. Yeah, I think just to quickly just uh, to build on that a little before Hannes, you come in. Um, we have a fabric, a digital fabrication lab, a fab lab. We are, can reduce uh, the amount of containers that go around by sharing plans and ideas and blueprints across the internet and manufacturing locally. There's a huge promise with this open source, user owned technologies that we can control and that we can use to aggregate value and keep wealth in the, the local areas. So Hannes, you wanted to come in. So over to you, Hannes, if you unmute yourself. Thank you very quickly to Michael. I think you might have discovered already that Savi has answered you on the on the chat uh, several times uh, with with the, whether that is a, a sufficient answer to you. I don't know, but I agree, of course, with you. Have also having been a long time into this, uh, that we are going in circles. But I think now with the Desira and with other projects, we have the possibility of getting. Uh, the experience uh, of of many years of of, of struggle uh, into you know updated uh, useful kind of information and I think that is one thing that we could have as a project you know where is the experience uh, of similar things how can we uh, integrate and share that in into our work so my my second remark is is to Antoine and to Jan I think that uh, the question. Um, of what is happening around the cities um, has been um, the uh, theme of uh, purple of the peri urban uh, networks there's also a lot of experience there the the uh, current big um, 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 uh, quarrel and 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 conflict i i was mentioning in the chat around brussels is a very interesting one uh, where the city indeed has said we want to conserve a green uh, a belt around the city for food for the city and immediately there was a very strong reaction from the landowners around the city and of course of people who are speculating of uh, building houses there um, and and I think that is another one apart from you know access to land questions which which of course uh, we see in every single local food project uh, the question of what kind of a relation is possible with cities who need space. And I think the, the example Jan uh, was presenting uh, 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 near Amsterdam is really, really an interesting thing. And the news we should spread, you know, if you buy land near a city, you should um, uh, offer land for farmers and you should uh, you should get people in to produce food. I think that is a brilliant story. We should really uh, get around. I think that also ticks on Mario's concern, who is with us uh, today. He he has been uh, struggling a long time uh, to make people aware that um, every day and every year, lots and lots of land is just taken away from uh, uh, the possibility of producing food, concrete, concrete, concrete cities, building more housing. And that discussion, of course, in the context of local food production is a very important one. Sorry to be long, but I think there are many fields which we can draw from here, uh, which we can further develop after this conference. Thank you to everybody for organizing this. It's an excellent story. Well, thank you, Hannes Lorenzen, uh, expert weaver of a few different themes there. Uh, fantastic. Hannes from, um, from Art 2020. Someone from Forum Synergies, I'm not sure who that is, wants to come in. And just before you come in, Sonia is uh, highlighting the principle of tools for conviviality by Ivan Illich, which is similar to what Ollie's saying about appropriate technologies, ones that can be for the people and be used by the people, repaired by us, uh, and not um, taking away our autonomy. So, um, Forum Synergies wants to come in with a hand. Can you hear me? It's Simone from Forum Synergies. Yeah, Simone. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, hi. Nice to see you. Um, I would like bring in another aspect related to the topic of digitalization, which I normally miss in the discussions, and that is the, the, the importance of traditional ecological knowledge, where I feel that this uh, discussion around digitalization is, is accelerating this process of loss of this knowledge. 
and living myself in a region um, which is affected again exactly this day from uh, some extreme weather disaster. We are cut off from electricity for several days, some of us. And uh, yeah, so no electricity at all, no digital tools at all. And I experience again that the traditional knowledge, the traditional ecological knowledge from local people is the only source we have at the moment. So this is not against, but please don't forget about the importance of this knowledge. And uh, I would like to see this point in the discussion appear, what we can do to safeguard and to develop that further at the same time. Thank you. Thanks, Simona. And that was, that's a really good point. We were so vulnerable. Imagine we were in this pandemic uh, in blackouts and no uh, internet and Netflix. So we become so dependent so quickly on these technologies and we have to be very careful of that. Yeah, so um, digitization is a very interesting topic. We've obviously, we've done a whole series on it on Art 2020 actually as well. Um, and just to emphasize as well, Desiree's approach to digitization is about problems and solutions, not just about solutions. Uh, and just as well to mention that we will be doing a summary of this particular event. The presentations will be available. Uh, we'll make sure there's lots of links to all the different organizations. It's been great to hear from different parts of Europe that I don't often hear from. Um, so yeah, but I'll pass over to you there, Debbie. I think my voice is a bit low again. Okay, I think you're okay there, Ollie. Uh, we probably got maybe two minutes before a hand back to um, Marina from Forum Synergies just to close. So does anyone else uh, like to make a point or come in and reflect on what we've been talking about? Can I just say that I was amused by the uh, example from the Netherlands, um, which looking down on it in that air photograph way, looked so much like a modern equivalent of the small uh, farming communities of, let us say, Romania, which are collapsing in the face of um, pressures of all kinds. There, there are, I mean, the, it was very nice to see something to be candid, uh, which was so messy, um, uh, but which is so dependent upon the 80% um, of income uh, which the people are getting by working in the city. So here we are with with a remote part of Europe, uh, such as Bulgaria, Romania, parts of Slovakia and so on, where small farming systems are collapsing, peasant farming systems are collapsing. And here we are creating something which is like a modern peasantry, which is the, which is like hobby hobby farming that you find in places like Slovakia, where, where, where people have got effectively an exaggerated garden. They're not making their money from it. They're making their food or some of their food from it. It's very interesting to me soci sociologically uh, and in that um, tragic contrast to those parts of peasant Europe where the peasantry are dying away because the youngsters don't want to go into it. And there is no adjacent city where people can make the bulk of their, their money um, and then survive on the farms. A really ironic contrast to me. Well, thank you, Michael, uh, for, for that reflection again. Uh, we have come to the end of this webinar. Uh, thanks so much for the people that have joined us on YouTube with the live stream. Uh, thanks to all the speakers. I'm going to hand back to Marina now just for the formal closing and thanks. But from our digital studio in Clock Jordan Eco Village, where we, myself and Ollie, can engage with people like you all over Europe, all over the world on a daily basis, where we can have our community supported agriculture feeding 100 families and with a digital open source tool open out to maybe another 500 families. And the stories we heard today were so inspiring of this ecosystem approach. 
the sort of food web approach where we stop seeing ourselves as competitors and we start to cooperate and collaborate uh, to build stronger local economies, meaningful work and livelihoods in our regions, and especially resilience to cope with the shocks that are, we're facing and we're going to face a lot more. So from myself and Ollie uh, here in Clock Jordan, uh, thanks to Arc 2020 and Forum Synergies for allowing us at Cultivate to engage and we'll pass back to Marina. Thank you, Davy. Um, thanks for your facilitation. Thanks, thanks to you and, and Oli for that work. Um, just before closing, I will say, well, just remind you that uh, this event has been um, recorded and that uh, we'll try to bring a small summary of it, is it uh, as a podcast or as a short video, but um, those who have been there and those who couldn't uh, see it will have access to, to, to some of the main highlights. And um, yes, I think that we had a, a very interesting uh, exchange uh, from new or not so new initiative, depending on the angle you're looking at them, but uh, it's, uh, it, they, it maybe shows uh, the need of uh, following, reflecting about what is the ownership of the project related to food, the need of dialogue between different visions, uh, also a reflection about what are our principles when we are talking about agroecology versus mainstream uh, farming. So I think that there is need to, um, to follow working on that and, and also to follow um, giving uh, or uh, bringing that message to the younger generations also. It, uh, as uh, Michael was saying, it seems that we are in circle, but it's also maybe a question of generation. So this is at the art of Forum Synergy's work. And I think that with that in partnership with uh, with ARC, uh, Ecolise, and all the partners uh, will probably follow working on these topics. Thank you. Thanks to you all.